So Ryan, what's on your radar? The Democrats are now staring down the possibility of marching into the 2022 midterms telling voters that they really would have loved to deliver on all those popular things that Joe, that Joe Biden promised he'd do as president. But you see, there was this darn lady in the Senate called the parliamentarian, and she just said we weren't allowed to do them. But vote for us again, and this time we'll totally do all of the things, just as long as she says it's okay. Now, coming into this session, it was obvious that the 60-vote threshold would be a problem. It's important to underscore that that filibuster threshold was created in 1975, not at the country's founding. The left's way to deal with that obstacle was to, on the one hand, push to end the filibuster, which requires the buy-in of 50 senators, while on the other hand, using the budget reconciliation process to get as much done as possible. The filibuster remains in place, and Democrats did manage to push a nearly $2 trillion rescue bill through Congress in February. But Schumer badly miscalculated in leaving the parliamentarian in place after that February legislation, during which she issued an opinion saying that a $15 minimum wage couldn't go through using reconciliation. The truth was, Schumer didn't actually have the votes to pass it, but her opinion, which she turned in as just a single line, should have by itself been a fireable offense. Imagine if the president went to the office of general counsel and asked for an advisory opinion on the legality of some project, and the general counsel came back and said, no, or came back and said, yes, it's legal. That would be insane. The council isn't a judge that issues a verdict from on high. There's staff who offer expert analysis, but that's it. Beyond that, it's up to the people who are elected by voters to make the decisions. Schumer didn't fire the parliamentarian, and now he's in a jam because she just ruled. Now, it's not a ruling, it's an opinion, but she and the Senate treat it like a ruling. She offered her opinion that Democrats can't do immigration reform through reconciliation. Now, there could be solid reasons on the merits to make that ruling, but this time, she did write an actual opinion longer than one line, and her argument is absurd. I'll get to that in a second, but first, Let's hear directly from the Senate. Let's hear directly about the Senate from Elizabeth McDonough, the parliamentarian herself. In her own words, you'll see what a mistake it was for Schumer to have kept her. McDonough has done precious little public speaking. She joined the Senate as a junior parliamentarian in 1999 and slowly worked her way up the ranks, partly thanks to Republicans firing the parliamentarian in 2001 because they didn't like his rulings, his opinions. In 2018, she spoke to the graduating class of her alma mater, Vermont Law School. She tells a charming story of her tutelage at the feet of Senator Robert Byrd. Byrd, a former majority leader, famously went to law school while serving the Senate from West Virginia, the seat Joe Manchin sits in now. Byrd was a master of Senate rules and was an architect of some significant reforms. From 1917 until 1975, the Senate needed two-thirds of those present to end a filibuster. In 75, the rule was changed so that now it only took three-fifths, but that, was all, uh, that wasn't all of sitting senators, it was just the ones who were there. So you needed three-fifths of all sitting senators. A few years later, a frustrated bird tried to change the rules again. 20 years later, McDonough joined the parliamentarian's office and tells this story. In my early years in the parliamentarian's office, none other than Senator Robert C. Byrd, the true guru of all things Senate procedure, would come to the office each day and ask me questions about precedent and rules, and I was very often stymied. I would struggle to answer, pick up a rule book, and Senator Byrd would say something really encouraging like, you won't find the answer in there. <laughs> and he would leave, giving me lots of side eye. So from Bob Byrd, we have the so-called Byrd Rule, which sets the terms by which a provision can go through the process known as budget reconciliation. Because 60 votes has effectively become unattainable for anything remotely controversial for either party, reconciliation is now what the Senate uses to pass anything serious. And the Senate has delegated authority to decide what fits through that process to the parliamentarian. The criticism of McDonough internally is that her 20 plus years in the Senate have warped her understanding of her role. She doesn't think that she's a staffer who works on behalf of the elected senators, who themselves work on behalf of the voters who sent them there, as they ought to in a representative democracy. Instead, 
She believes she's there to represent the Senate as an institution, an institution that is cloaked more in mythology than reality. She has seen senators come and go, and she believes that she is the Senate, and that her opinions are not opinions, but rulings, and when they are not followed, destruction follows. That's more or less how she put it in her own words in her commencement address. When she arrived in the Senate, it was routine for the Senate to pass major legislation with a bare majority. That no longer happens. Yet as McDonough talks about it, she's fighting to preserve something that is already gone. Sadly, success is also not a permanent condition. In the Senate, this should be stated as, you will not always be in the majority, so please take the long view. <laughs> Taking the long view is a part of what I do every day as I represent the interests of my unseen client, the institution of the Senate itself. While serving its 100 members on a day-to-day -day basis, I still represent the Senate. No matter who is in my office asking for assistance, with its, I represent the Senate with its traditions of unfettered debate, protection of minority rights, and equal power among the states. That's always there. That Senate is my charge. And it was the protection of the Senate's rules and precedents that brought me into conflict with the Senate majority back in 2013 when talk of overturning the Senate's cloture rule for nominations by what is called the nuclear option was revived. It was my duty to advocate for preservation of that rule. And in doing so, I worked with all the gangs, the, not the Sharks and the Jets kinds, but the <laughs> senators' gangs, which are not, they don't have cool jackets and things. Um, <laughs> we worked on compromise orders. Warn, I was warning of nuclear winter, the erosion of the Senate's trademark comity, and the danger of setting such a precedent. I cautioned against the loss of the 60-vote threshold as a bulwark against pressure from the executive branch. And I hope that there would be some understanding that the rules that some in the Senate wanted to amend for a limited advantage were there to protect them from disadvantage in all other circumstances. And for a time, it seemed as though the center would hold. But by November, the argument was lost. The chair, on my advice, ruled against a point of order lowering the threshold for cloture. But an appeal was taken, and I was overturned. It was a stinging defeat that I tried not to take personally. That wasn't easy. As Justice Breyer recently said in a discussion with students at Tufts, lawyers in particular are supposed to be able to explain things. And I felt I'd fallen far short. Those things happen, however. You lose, your client loses, precedent is made, and precedent will be used. So I dusted myself off and readied for the renewal of the exact same argument, which came four years later, just last year, with the same result but with the parties completely reversed. The one thing I can tell you about situations like this is that it will never feel good or rewarding enough to say I told you so when people finally understand the point of which you are trying to convince them. Okay, first of all, the idea that she was proven right because McConnell nuked the filibuster for Supreme Court nominees and therefore Democrats never should have done it for lower court judges, is incredibly naive for somebody who knows McConnell personally. To get Neil Gorsuch onto the court, McConnell would have ended the filibuster no matter what Democrats had done. If Democrats hadn't ended it, McConnell would have just had that many more vacancies to fill. But the fact that she thinks events proved her right bodes terribly for Democrats if they're relying on her. I wanted to pick out a few other things from that story that are also revealing, like this. We worked on compromise orders. Warn, I was warning of nuclear winter, the erosion of the Senate's trademark comity, and the danger of setting such a precedent. I cautioned against the loss of the 60-vote threshold as a bulwark against pressure from the executive branch. Wait, what? You were actively working with groups of senators who were organizing against the effort to reform the filibuster? On whose authority was she doing that? The parliamentarian is supposed to work for every senator and ultimately for the Senate majority leader, not take sides in factional disputes among senators who are supposed to be accountable to voters. Here's another line that gives insight into how she views her role. An appeal was taken and I was overturned. No, 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 no. The parliamentarian was not overturned. The chair of the Senate was overturned by a vote of the Senate. And this. It was a stinging defeat that I tried not to take personally. That wasn't easy. 
No, it was not a stinging defeat. It was a win by senators who wanted to change the rules of the Senate, just as the rules of the Senate have been changed regularly throughout the chamber's history. The speech she gave here is good evidence that the complaints are well-grounded, that she does think that she operates on a plane above the elected senators. And frankly, the senators have given her every reason to think that, and most likely, they like it that way, because then they can just blame her for whatever they don't accomplish. In response to her recent opinion, a number of members of the House pointed out that the Senate still has options. AOC is right here. Her opinion can be ignored. And if Democrats like Joe Manchin want, they can say they're taking the long view. There's an irony in McDonough's decision to tighten what can go through reconciliation in that it will only put more pressure on the institution to finally end the 60 vote threshold, which McDonough believes is a sacred part of the institution. She believes that lie, even though intellectually she must know that it's not true. The heyday of that threshold just happens to overlap with the bulk of her career in the parliamentarian's office. From that office, she's now tossing off memos that are shaping the lives of millions of people. She's wrong to do it, but she's not really the one to blame. Democrats have to ask themselves if they truly want to be responsible for governing. If so, do it. If not, then what are you doing? And so she issued her opinion recently, and it's private. It, it circulates just among senators, but uh, it, it leaked out. I got a, I got a, I got a copy of it. And what's, what's so odd about it is that she, has, she calls the immigration reform tremendous policy change. And she said, you know, the value of it to uh, immigrants uh, cannot be weighed in federal dollars. Like that's, she, and, and in it, she, be, she waxes poetic about the, the travails of, of migrants coming into this, this country in a way where you're like, what's going on here? Like, this is, not, this, is not, this is not a role here. And if good things happening that are significant to people means you can't do something through reconciliation, how can you do prescription drug reform that would save people's lives? Because you can't measure somebody's life in federal dollars. How can you do climate change? How, say, rescuing the planet from apocalypse can't be measured in federal dollars. So if you well, take she, her logic to... She's adhering to a right. very institutionalist perspective mm -hmm. where it has to fit into, the, of course, the parameters of budget reconciliation. So it's a budgetary matter, which is the excuse she's using um, with regard to immigration, that it's it's a, an issue, a policy area so much bigger than the money that's going to be spent around it. I would say this, because I've been on, on the Republican side of this debate mm -hmm. when members like Jim Jordan and Mark Meadows in the heyday of the Freedom Caucus were pushing the parliamentarian to allow aspects of Obamacare repeal into right. budget reconciliation and, as I mentioned, you know, defunding Planned Parenthood and abortion providers within and it. And she kept some of that out. And she right? kept some of it yeah. out. I, I, I take kind of the perspective that we don't want to govern from hyper-partisan to hyper-partisan as parties change over in election cycles and that it actually is good to have some sort of backstops. That said, an unelected, you know, appointed or hired official shouldn't be the sole decider of what can and can't be done. Uh, but there, I mean, the, the, our founders intended for the Senate to be sort of the place where you pump the brakes and you try to actually come together and create good, sound policy at a greater vote threshold than the simple majority you would need in the House. And I don't actually think that that's a bad thing, um, well, especially yeah. something like so immigration reform. I, I, I think you and I agree there's just no way it's going to get done right now. The political dynamics are not in the favor. But we do have a huge migration crisis at our border. You've got 14,000 Haitian uh, immigrants just living under a bridge in terrible conditions. You have 200,000 border crossings a month. If our elected officials are not capable um, in the Senate of coming together and saying, OK, Republicans, you care about securing the border. We care about amnesty for the close to 11 million illegal immigrants in the country. Let's get something done. Then, honestly, they should just they should move on with their lives and we should get people who can do that. All right. One amendment to that is that the, the Senate has historically protected minority rights by allowing every state to have two senators. But uh, majority vote was the was the, the was the regular order for the Senate, um, you know, up until 90s, 
90s, 2000s. It's true. I just, I feel like we're always, you know, the party switching over away from the other party being opposed to, the, to nuking the filibuster. I mean, I worry about the things that could get done and just rammed through under a Democrat Senate right yeah. now. But of course, you know, I think of wonderful things we could do under a Republican president. I don't think backstops are a bad thing necessarily in politics. Right. And we'll have more rising right after this.